Hi, my name is Madeline Holly Rosing. I'm the writer creator of the steampunk supernatural series, Boston Metaphysical Society. We're currently running a Kickstarter for our first ever audio drama called The Ghost Ship, which you can find at kickstarter.com or through our website. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a returning guest. It feels like she was just on here last week, but it was actually a couple of months back. Um, coming back with a brand new project. You know her work from the Boston Metaphysical Society. We're joined today by Madeline Holly Rosing. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me on the show again, Kurt. I really appreciate it. Well, anytime. I mean, it's safe to say that behind you, you're fairly busy with, with a lot of work it seems and i know your your previous kickstarter was successful as well too so congratulations on thank that. you but and you hinted at this at our last interview which i'll post a link somewhere you know to the right or left of us here that you were doing another project and that's why you're back on here so tell us what this new project is all about well it's called boston metaphysical society the ghost ship and it is our first ever audio drama Based in the time period of our original six-issue miniseries, for those of you who are not familiar with Boston Metaphysical, the overall premise is about an ex-Pinkerton detective, a spirit photographer, and a genius scientist who battles supernatural forces in late 1800s Boston. The ghost ship takes place in the original six-issue miniseries, like I mentioned. It features Samuel, Caitlin, and Granville, our, our three major characters, the first season is, is eight episodes at about 30 minutes a piece. It's a full cast, a special effects, music, and we got some terrific actors and a great production team on board. So I'm very, very excited about it. Well, you're the second or third creative person that I've had on the show in the past 13 years that is that is doing a radio drama like this. Two were from Toronto and mm -hmm. now you're from California. So that works out really well. <laughs> yeah. Why why did you want to create an, an audio play about your amazing series? I actually blame it all on Eddie Louise. And <laughs> she is the script editor uh for the ghost ship and my mentor and has, has taught me a lot about the audio drama business as well. We became friends. We'd met through some steampunk conventions and we hung out at the, the Nebula convention pre pandemic. And she said, you, you have to do this as an audio drama. She goes, I, I just, you, you have to. And I said, and, and she actually wasn't the first person who said that to me. There were, there were several others who did it as well. And because I just really thought it was be well suited and and I agreed, but I just I didn't know how to start that process. But luckily for me, Eddie Louise and her husband, Chip, are veteran audio drama producers with Sage and Savant, which was on for four years. So I said, OK, I will give this a try, but you guys have to come on board as my production team. And so they said, oh, yeah, <laughs> we'll do this. And they've been absolutely fabulous to work with. Obviously, I am the producer of this thing. I, I do hold the producer role. It's not glamorous, as some people might think it might be. It has more to do with getting casting notices out there, listening to auditions, weeding out first cuts, second cuts, finalists. I mean, we, we had a huge amount of people who did audition for this. So we just had a an amazing amount of talent to choose from. So ultimately it was very, very difficult to come down to our final cast list, contracts and lawyers and incorporation and making sure everybody gets paid. And, you know, then in the, in the meantime, listening and discussing the, the episodes and the scenes with my audio director, Chip, and, you know, making, making, you know, not only creative decisions, but production decisions of how to move forward um, when certain issues come up. He has laid out the voice tracks for all eight episodes. So that part is done. Um, he's now working on the special effects and some of the music, which you heard uh, from the excerpt uh, that anyone can go in and listen to on our Kickstarter page. When I first heard the excerpt, because that's the first time I'd heard it with no, I'd only heard it before with special effects. 
but not with the full music and everything. I'm going like, okay, this is going to be so much fun. This just sounds so amazing. That was the, the one thing that I, that caught my ear, <laughs> you know, usually it's a visual medium for the people that were, you know, for the creative mm -hmm. people that I have on the show, it's always usually been a visual medium, but, but people don't understand the, the auditory aspect of these types of productions yeah. because it's amazing how, just a, a simple sound can trigger something in your subconscious or even just uh, add to the scene itself too. I want to touch on also the, the amazing actors and actresses you have on, on this mm -hmm. play as well too, because very distinct voices, you could easily separate them from each other, but they played well off of each other, at least in the, in the excerpt that I, I heard. Can you tell us about who is starring in this series? Emily Snyder is uh <laughs> plays Caitlin O'Sullivan. Um, I don't have her bio right in front of me. She has, you know, she makes her living doing theater and uh, live theater and, and voiceover work. She, we, like I've mentioned before, we really had some outstanding auditions for this. So it was really tough. And so essentially what I would do is I would pick my top three. I sent them to Eddie Louise she would give me her opinion and then I would go back and make the ultimate, you know, decision of like, okay, you know, this one. And if that didn't work, you know, we'd have like our top three for every major, you know, for lead for Samuel, Caitlin and um, Granville. What really struck me about Emily was the sparkle in her voice. And that was what I would hear in my own head when I, whenever I thought about Caitlin and who Caitlin was how she was a very much a woman of her time, but she was always pushing against the barriers, sometimes a little harder <laughs> and sometimes, and, and she just, she didn't take a lot of guff, but you know, she also had to deal with things because of her social class and, and who she was. Ryan Philbrook, who plays uh, Samuel Hunter, had the kind of snarkiness that I also envisioned with Samuel, but also the depth of character and empathy, empathy that Samuel always has had. He is a deeply empathetic character. And I think that's one of the reasons that makes him such a good detective. And Ryan really, really captured that. And then uh, Martin Davis, who plays Granville, uh, had the gravitas in his voice that we we wanted for for Granville, who is the scientist, who is the more by the book kind of guy, where you know Samuel's the cowboy, Granville is okay. These are the rules. These are the order that we we do things. It was one of the things that Eddie Louise and I discussed long before we started casting. Is you know we wanted voices and personalities that fitted not only did they fit well but that each voice was distinctive so when someone who really you know didn't know anything about this or and even if they did they could tell immediately who was speaking and that they would complement each other and so these three really really complement complement each other very very well though so i was just in new york i was at new york comic con oh how was that excellent it was really done. They had limited capacity, but it was like going to a wonder con. And, and it was, it was lovely. It was lovely. And we sold out. So that was great. And I got to meet two of my voice actors because they came to help. <laughs> so that was really fun to meet them. That's awesome. Hopefully they got a lot of good pictures there too. Yes. They, I worked them. They worked. I said, if you're going to show up, I'm going to make you work. They said, okay. And so Emily uh, Snyder was there on Friday, uh, who plays Caitlin, and H.B. Gibson, came, who plays Thomas Edison, was there on Saturday. And he came in full regalia, steampunk regalia, the hat, the vest, and he was charming everyone at my table. He was just amazing. <laughs> when it came to choosing the, oh, and you also have a narrator as well. Too. Yeah, Kristen Udowitz. Well, I had made the decision early on that I wanted a female narrator because it just turned out that this particular story was very male heavy and there weren't a lot of female characters in it that just the way it worked out it wasn't planned that way which means of course that if we do a second season that will be more you know female centric 
just to balance balance everything off here. So yeah, I wanted another female voice in there. As Eddie Louise said, Louise says she kind of has a sort of librarian type voice that you would essentially you would believe anything that she told you. And and it's a very clear, precise. So yeah, I really I really loved Kristen's uh, narration. And, you know, she kept it very clean and very crisp. And, you know, this is someone you you would believe had done, you know, research on anything that you asked her about. I wish there was, you know, more I could have listened to in the excerpt, uh, but you wet wet my whistle with the two to three minutes that I I did get to hear. So (laughs) really well done on that. And of course, the only way to really hear this is to help support you on your Kickstarter campaign. So that works out really well. And I do have uh, kudos for our two uh, major supporting actors, Ryan Hoyle, who plays Jimmy McLaren, and Boyd Barrett, who plays Charles Emerson, who are just outstanding. And when you have scenes together with Caitlin and Jimmy, they're, they're just charming. They're just utterly charming. And I had written in uh, one of the episodes where they sing The Bard of Armagh together. And I remember in the casting notices, I said, you just need to carry a tune. I mean, these people aren't supposed to be perfect, right? And, and everything. That was fine. I, I'd be fine. Anyone just can carry a tune. It doesn't have to be this great singer. And then we hire Emily and, and Ryan Hoyle, get them together to sing. And oh, my God. They, they are so good. And Chip really did an amazing job directing them because he says, okay, um, you know, I had written in the script in that particular scene where she's trying to guide him through the song for a particular reason. I don't want to say what reason because it'd be a spoiler. Yeah. And so it starts out very hesitant on, on her part because she's in some physical pain. And then as the pain releases... And, and he becomes more confident in what he's doing. They harmonize and the voices, you know, become strong by the, by the end of, of the song. Yeah, it was Chip's idea to definitely to have them harmonize. It's just beautiful. It's, I, I was, he shared it with them after he finished doing the, the audio engineering on that particular scene. And even the two actors are going like, oh my God, he makes it sound so beautiful. <laughs> There, at Sandy, I, I really can't compliment uh, the actors enough. They put it out there and did retakes, and well, let's say they just did more than one retake because Chip <laughs> Chip can be very demanding. Watching him work, I learned a lot about audio drama, and you know, working with the actors, I learned that if we do do well enough enough to do a second season, uh, you know, it would be a brand new story, but you know, I just know the scripts would be better because I would know, I now know how to better direct the actors on the page and where I want them to be. So yeah, it's been a really interesting creative process, bringing this whole world into a different medium. You've put your life into this series. You've done an amazing job with the the comic books, uh, with the graphic novels themselves. And foraying into the audio drama section here, What didn't you know about audio drama that will improve you as a creative person? I think thinking about space, space in which the characters live on not only, I guess, a deeper sense of where they live on an an audio level and the sounds around them and how that affect them. And I mean, obviously, as a writer, you you write that in prose, you write that in, in everything you do um, as a writer, no matter what the medium. But I think writing an audio drama script really brought that home on how sounds can tell us when the power in the scene has changed. It's a different kind of mindset when writing an, an audio drama script. It is a communication document like a comic book script is. As you know, a comic book script is, is literally a, a communication document to your artist, your letterer, your colorist, um, possibly pre-production. That all goes into the script. And much is the same but different 
in an audio drama because here you're communicating to your actors and to your audio engineer. It's just interesting how a script boils down to when, when it's a collaborative event, you know, unlike a novel, which is just for you and the reader, that this is a collaborative environment. And so you have to write a clear document that other people can understand and then execute. Because you've worked with many people, especially with this collaborative effort regarding this series, was there anything that you had to, I'm not going to say fight for to keep in the script, but from an editing perspective, did you edit anything out that you later put back in or did you edit things out so that it made it a better production overall? I, I don't remember taking something out and putting it back in. Usually what I took out needed to come out. <laughs> that works out. Yeah, it, it needed to come out. And Eddie Louise's editing was was great because she would also put notes on the side of like of different choices I could make. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes she put like, you could do A, B, and sometimes I would come up with C and she would say like, oh yeah, that's even better, which is fine because that's the purpose of notes. You don't necessarily do the notes that the editor gave you, but you look at the suggestions they gave you and you try to come up with something even better than that. And that's usually, you know, the right thing. Was there a scene uh, in out of all of these eight episodes that besides the, the harmonizing one, which sounds incredible, I do want to hear that. <laughs> uh, was there another scene that, that you just blew you out of the water when you finally, when you heard it, the finished product? Well, I haven't quite heard all the finished product. I've just heard the voice tracks, but they, they don't have everything else in them. Samuel, when he's toe to toe with Boyd Barrett playing, you know, uh, Charles Emerson, you know, those two knocking heads was really interesting and, and a lot of fun because uh, Charles Emerson is the head of Great House Emerson in Boston and has a lot of power. Uh, Samuel, for those who don't know, used to be married into a great house, the House Wellsmore, um, but his wife um, has since passed away. So he, he came from what you would call middle class, but he straddles these two worlds between middle class and the great house. And so he kind of has an in to great houses, but yet the great houses still want to use him. And yeah, it just, it's, it was really nice to see the conflict between the two. I'm worried I'm going to give away spoiler. So <laughs> what were some of the themes in this particular story that you've created that spoke to you, not only as a writer, but also as a, a creative person? We do touch on the issue of consent. It's very brief, but it's important. Uh, and it's the way that, you know, Samuel treats Caitlin and others have to do with uh, one of the big themes that is throughout Boston Metaphysical has to do with classism, with the touch of racism and sexism uh, thrown in. But yeah, one of the big themes is, is classism. And you see that quite a bit in Granville's interaction with not only Charles Emerson, but with Thomas Edison who uh, is not in all the episodes, but yeah, he shows up. <laughs> I'm sure there's no love lost between the two. Oh, guys. no. <laughs> uh, with, with the creation of this audio drama, uh, is it everything that you expected it to be when you finally finished the eight episodes? I'll tell you when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Chip Chip sent me some some more uh, uh, clips to listen to. I haven't listened to them yet as we're trying to, to fine tune and, and get the first episode completely done with special effects and music. Because once that's done, he has a template for finishing off, you know, the rest, you know, fairly quickly. So I know the first episode is going to going to take the longest it's actually better than I, I thought it was going to be. And just listening to the excerpt, which you did, it was like, oh, wow, this is like way better than I ever thought it was going to be. <laughs> I think it's going to be terrific. 
Eddie Louise and Chip are, I mean, Eddie Louise is just going like, no, this is going to be crazy good. You know, obviously I'm going to believe her because she's my script editor. They also know more than I do about this. Having gone through four seasons of Sage and Savant, Sage and Savant, I will bow to their expertise. Putting faith in a collaborative effort with the people that you work with is obviously a good thing to have. Why do you trust Eddie Louise and Chip so much with this project? Uh, well, I have listened to Sage and Savant and I heard mm-hmm. what they, they did there and they did a fabulous job. So I have you know no doubt of their competency. I also seem to be really good at picking talent. <laughs> I guess there's a talent in picking talent. And I have been very fortunate both with the graphic novel and with the audio drama to have picked well. Obviously, that was with the, with the audio drama that was with the guidance of uh, Chip, and, Chip and Eddie Louise. Yeah, I, I seem to have a good knack for that. I guess I'm just going to say that I have a good knack for choosing well uh, who I'm going to work with. And I think part of that is I don't rush the process. I wait until everything, you know, all the, the, you know, all the planets are aligned, so to speak. I wait for the right partners. I've been, I've been approached a number of times of like, oh, don't you want to turn this into a TV show or a movie? You know, and the answer, of course, is, you know, of of course, you know, who wouldn't want to see their IP on Netflix or something? But I am very much willing to wait for the right partner. I certainly feel no need to, you know, jump at the first thing. So, yeah, I'm I'm very patient in that regards. You have a an idea of what your next story is going to be uh, when you get, and I'm going to say when you get a second season, because I think this will be successful. <laughs> no, because right now I am working on one, doing the outline for the next Boston metaphysical graphic novel, which needs to be done first. And also as you may or may not heard, I'm doing a story for lady mechanica. Those will take my, my priority after we're done fulfilling the last Kickstarter, which we're in the middle of right now, finishing this off and making sure it's successful, and then producing those rewards for those backers. Can you talk about your Lady uh, Mechanica project or no? Yeah, I'll, I can tell you it's called The Secret Garden. And uh, that's all I'm going to say. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be working with them. That's, yeah. I'm, this is going to be a blast. I can't wait to uh, get their notes back and really start moving on the story. What has been the reaction to the excerpt from, from people that get to listen to it? Uh, I've only had two comments. And one gentleman said he found it to be a little tinny. But I, I think that was probably because of his computer speakers or possibly whatever he was listening to. Um, but I do know that, you know, the CD is going to be CD quality audio, and I know all of it's going to be audio. And then, and then we had another comment that said that it sounded beautiful. And then you listened to it, it sounded beautiful. I've listened to it, it sounds beautiful. So it really depends on what device, you know, if you're listening on, you know, it depends on how old your device is, how good your speakers are. And there's so many factors there, but oh no, the audio quality is going to be excellent. Chip runs a lot of this stuff through my husband because my husband is an audiophile. So if my husband's going like something doesn't sound right, you can believe he tells Chip. (laughs) So no, the audio quality is going to be very good. That's one thing I have with these types of headphones. They are, they are surround sound. They are run through a soundboard and all that other stuff as well too. It's just for my audio production side of things. But I could hear the the underlying tones. I could hear the basses. I could hear the trebles. I could hear everything like that. And, and the the vocal quality was top notch. I mean, I could hear accents and breaths and everything like that as they were speaking. It was just really well done to the point that um, I could just close my eyes and just imagine just sitting back with a glass of bourbon, watch you know, listening to this type deal with a roaring fire. There you go. I listen to audiobooks and and other audio stories when I'm at the gym. You know, it's a great way to do your cart when you're on the elliptical machine or something. It's like, there's your story and <laughs> you listen to it. It's a very Halloween-y story too. So it's the kind of thing where, yeah, you maybe want to lower the lights and you put it on your stereo um, 
or if you're just sitting there with your mp3 player with a cup of tea or a glass of wine or whatever you like it's it's perfect for that and definitely with a fire going looking at the entire process of this and i, I know you're not quite complete with this overall process but you're you're close yeah. to finishing it from what you've learned what would you change at the very beginning to make your process easier <laughs> i had to laugh i probably would have cleaned my office <laughs> okay <laughs> just so i would have more room for all these files and then of course i didn't know we were going to be fulfilling the last Kickstarter now, I, I thought would be finished a couple months ago, so these would not be overlapping, um, which is probably why I didn't clean my office. I kept hoping, oh, she's going to be done. She's going to be done. These things happen, and we deal with it. Yeah, that's probably what I would have done. What Out of sight, out of mind, they say. That makes things easier. That's packing material behind me. So Kickstarter backers from uh, previous kicks, the previous Kickstarter know that Yes, they are coming. They are coming. Because I want this bubble wrap out of my office. Is there anything that I haven't touched on that you'd like to share and showcase with those that are watching and listening to this? Please go to the Kickstarter web, uh, website and pledge today. <laughs> yes, yes. There's a, uh, if you go to uh, our regular website, bossmetaphysicalsociety.com, there is a, a widget in the upper right-hand corner. Yes, upper right-hand corner where you can just click through. Or you go to kickstarter.com and just type in Boston Metaphysical and it's gonna come up. Well, it'll it's the only audio drama up there, but it'll also list the, the comic books as well. At what point are we good enough? Huh. We're never good enough, but what's the old saying? You know, perfection is the enemy of good enough. I think sometimes good enough is enough but as a creator you know you're always going to say it's never good enough but sometimes you have to stop and produce what you're doing and get it out there and and move on um because yeah i definitely believe that perfection is the enemy of, of good enough uh because i know people who are always like well it's not quite perfect it's not quite this it's not quite that it's like well are you ever going to be done are we ever going to see it uh, sometimes you just got to get it out. You got to be done and get it out there. And then if you've made mistakes, that's fine. You learn from that and you correct them and you move on for the next project. Perfection has gone out the window a long time ago for <laughs> me. So <laughs> I just want to get it done. That's the main thing. Just get it out of the way. Move on to the next thing. What's something you think every th person should experience once in their lifetime? Wow. Okay. There's like so many things. Uh, oh, I think everyone should walk barefoot in the surf. <laughs> or walk through a field of wildflowers. I think everyone should do that at least once in their life. Just make sure you're not going through a farmer's field barefoot. That's not always fun. Yes, and that probably through the wildflowers, wear shoes. Or if they're if they're protected wildflowers, then just look at them from afar <laughs> and take nice pictures. <laughs> and don't pick them. So I think the easiest thing is just to go go walk barefoot in the surf. Looking at this particular production, what is the wisest thing you heard someone say to you that stuck with you? Chip's instructions on listening to uh, uh, clips or scenes or the episode and to listen to them on different devices in different locations. Uh, that has been really smart because <clears throat> I've listened to uh, scenes and episodes on my phone, which by the way, sound fantastic on my phone. I was just I'm blown away on my laptop, put it into, you know, my husband's stereo system. And it was really interesting to hear the sound in different ways. Uh, also, if you're listening to it in the car and how road noise affects it, you know, how loud should something be? I've listened to audio dramas and books in the past where the volume was not consistent. And I constantly had to play with the volume control because 
parts of it were so low, I couldn't hear it. So I turned it up and then it would be blasting at me uh, one minute later when they changed the scene and for that particular situation. So yeah, that that's probably the wisest and smartest thing that I've really learned is, you know, listening to the audio drama on multiple devices. Also leveling your audio is always a good thing. To yes. Do. Yeah. And he's, I, he's doing a, an awesome job of doing that. Cause I would, I would say like, well, this sounds this way or that, I, you know, I'm and ask him. And then he would say like, okay, I can do this a little bit, but if I do it too much, this, this is going to happen or Y is going to happen or X is going to happen. I'm like, oh, okay. But yeah, it, it's great. Cause he would also explain to me why he, you know, could or couldn't do something based on my observation. And, and Chip is also great too. They, Chip and Eddie Louise live in downtown Los Angeles. You know, we've had obviously Zoom, mostly Zoom meetings because it's just convenient that way. But I went down and he walked me through his whole setup and how he puts together an episode and moves tracks and, and spaces things and, you know, the giant screen that was of everything. And, and that was that was fascinating. I had actually seen that once before, but it was nice to sit down with someone and, you know, walk me through how it all worked. And it gives me great respect for his ability. I, I love seeing that process. It's amazing watching the editing process of, of not only audio, but video as well too. And, and just seeing the true magicians at work, they do so much behind the scenes that people just aren't aware of. Yeah, no, that absolutely true. Absolutely true. I think we're about 68, six, last time I checked, 68, 69% uh, funded, which is great. But one of my stretch goals, which I really hope we get to, is to give bonuses to the actors and to the production team. Because I want to do that. <laughs> I mean, I want to show them my appreciation. So that is one of my stretch goals, is to uh, give bonuses to the team. The production values there. Those that are, are haven't had a chance to listen to the excerpt and support this campaign, you, you're going to be pleasantly surprised at the high quality that is this project. Plain and simple. It's it's amazing that the the production value is just incredible. Plain and simple. I, I don't know what else to say. I love it. Everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I I wouldn't say it was just one or two people. Uh, I was very fortunate when I started into uh, the indie comics world to have had a number of mentors, which led me to here. And uh, those would be, uh, a number of them <laughs> came from my first sequential art class at, at UCLA. Uh, one was the instructor himself. Um, uh, Nunzio um, de Felipe and uh, my classmates. I had some amazing classmates who were already either in the entertainment world in some respect or in the comics world. Uh, one was Christina Strain, um, who's gone on to do amazing things. Uh, I think she's a story editor and or um, showrunner of Shadow and Bone right now. Um, uh, God, Han Yi, who was in there. I mean, we just, that class was amazing. Um, uh, an old time, an old friend of mine, Dave, Dave Baxter, uh, who introduced me to Dave Elliott, who's been in the comics world forever. Uh, he really helped me out tremendously when I was first starting. Um, there's been, there's been a lot of people who have helped Boston Metaphysical Society succeed. And uh, it would not be as good as it is without them, with, without a doubt, without their feedback, without their support. And, um, and particularly, of course, my husband, who's been behind this project since the beginning. Uh, so I don't think I can never just name one person. Um, and then, of course, Eddie, Louise, and Chip, who, you know, convinced me to do this. <laughs> From a professional standpoint, you've now 
created your, well, you're on to your second Kickstarter. You have created an, another amazing project, now an audio drama of your amazing series, Boston Metaphysical, Boston Metaphysical Society. Uh, do you consider yourself personally successful? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, uh, we've been very fortunate in the comic uh, as an independent, but before we got picked up by Source Point Press was self-sustaining for the last four or five years. And, and that's a pretty amazing accomplishment for an indie comic. You know, before that, yeah, we, we were putting in, you know, our... <laughs> our own money. And then, you know, we'd run a Kickstarter and then pay back the kitty and, you know, do that all. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, just also professionally, it's been really nice uh, to be part of the indie comic creator community. And now I'm joining a different indie creator community, which is the, the audio drama, audio fiction. They are an amazing bunch of people. Um, I'm just, beginning now to get to know them. I hope to get to know more of them uh, in the future. It's a whole new world and a whole new set of people to meet. And I'm very excited about that. I have to ask, what does SourcePoint Press offer you in terms of uh, a publisher and maybe from a, a creator standpoint? Uh, well, I retain my own IP. They essentially distribute. But as you've probably seen, they are at every cons there there are cons everywhere they're very aggressive with their sales so yeah they sell my books <laughs> and i don't have to be there and that's like amazing <laughs> no they've been extremely supportive uh it's a great team over at source point they really particularly during the the pandemic they really thought outside the box and grew while other publishers contracted, you know, I really have to, to hand it to them that they, they sat down and, and they figured it out. They figured out what they needed to do to grow and be bigger and better. Well, they have a lot of accomplishments, but the most probably most recent public one was they are now, they brought back Felix the Cat and have a animation deal at DreamWorks to do a series. So, you can't really call them a small publisher, a small press anymore. They're really, they're not. It's kind of interesting because every once in a while you'll see something in the press that refers to them as such. And it's like, have you not been paying attention? <laughs> because no, they're really, no, they're, they're not a small publisher anymore. I remember when they were a small publisher because I knew Travis. I met him for the first time at my first Boston Comic-Con and they were just doing horror comics and that was it. And it was just like Travis and one other person and they still hold held other jobs and, and did this. And Source Point is under Oxide Media and they do games and they do they do a ton of stuff. So they're they're a good publishing company. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, I figure out what I did wrong, you know, when I did it incorrectly and um, re-strategize. I obviously will feel bad about the failure, um, but I try not to dwell on it too long and see how I can turn it around into something that works. Uh, a really good example, and we may have talked about this before uh, in our previous interview, is a very, I've run, well, this is Kickstarter number 10 for the audio drama, I've run kick, 10 Kickstarters. The first one failed and failed badly. And this was like seven years ago. And we, I knew it was gonna fail. Uh, there was a lot of reasons and, you know, I figured out what those were. And, you know, so I, a couple days before we ended, I, I canceled the campaign and thanked everybody and you know, what I did and, you know, my husband and I, we talked about it. We re-strategized how to approach Kickstarter. And, and at the time I was trying to do the entire six issue miniseries. We'd already finished three of the six uh, issues for the miniseries. 
And so we were trying to finish up as a whole trade. And it was just too much money for someone nobody knew. And so we broke it up in the future into smaller pieces. And ever since then, it has been successful. Um, but yeah, that, that failure hit me pretty hard. And, and it was difficult. But you know, I took some time off, came up with a different plan, and then relaunched uh, a couple months later. And the rest is history. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. Now that you have an audio drama, you may have inspired the next generation of, of audio drama producers and possibly voice actors for these types of audio dramas with whatever else they decide to create from a creative perspective. It could be whatever they want to create. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? By creating what they want to create and showing it, it can be done. Yeah, just keep moving forward. And I know it's tough, uh, particularly economically. Uh, I'm in a very fortunate position um, that I've been able to do this. Uh, and not everyone is in that position. You know, if you do have a, a creative dream, you know, how do you, that's tough. Um, don't listen to the naysayers. And, and I know this is kind of cliche because you, you hear this all the time, you know, don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to people who say like, oh, it's never going to work. It's never going to be as successful, but you do have to ignore them. And there's always going to be naysayers and someone who is going to be negative about your work. You do have to ignore them and you have to teach those who come after you to ignore them as well. And that's hard. And it takes maturity to do that. I guess in your heart, you want everyone to love your work, but not everyone is going to. That's just a matter of fact. Not Boston Metaphysical is not for everybody. And I know that. And that's fine. Uh, I want them to go find what they're happy with. If they're happy with mine, great. If they're happy with something else, that's great too. I would want them to pass on self-confidence. I, I think that's really what I'm trying to say is I want them to pass on. I, would want, I want to pass on self-confidence to those who come after me. And I want them to pass on self-confidence to those who come after them. Especially creative people in general, they find that, I find, at least in speaking with them, that they are so shut down by, you know, oh, you, you know, you need to get a real job or you need to do this or you need to do that to be successful, but you're happy and passionate about what you're creating. That should be your, your focus, your goal. Yeah. Like if you're not happy doing something, then you're just like everyone else that's suffering through, you know a lack of creativity. You only live once. So go be happy and do what makes you happy. And there's going to be family and friends and strangers who, who are always going to have their, shall I say, point of view. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you just got to walk away. You got to walk away and go and go find your true family and your true friends who say like, hey, I like what you're doing. This is cool. Or, you know, I still think what you're doing is cool. It's not really my thing, but I still think what you're doing is cool. And that's all right, too. Because I have, as you probably realize, I have a ton of creative friends. And I, I know a lot of people in the comics industry and in the conventions. And not everybody's comic appeals to me. Of course not. <laughs> I'm going to still encourage them because there's other people who do like what they're doing. And if they like what they're doing, great. It doesn't matter what I think as long as they're happy with what they're doing. Exactly. And, that, and that's part of passing on the self-confidence. But as I like to say to people now, I'm old and I know things. So I can, <laughs> I can like, do this now because I don't care anymore. I just keep doing it. And because, yeah, you only live once. Well, you know, Madeline, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, how can we support you and where can we find you on the Internet to support your amazing projects that I know you're going to have not only now, but in the future? As you can see, the website below, 
there's always a blog post there of, of what we're doing. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Boston Metaphysical Society Comic, on Twitter, uh, which is M Holly Rosing, and Instagram at MCH Holly One, I think. Uh, but right now we're running the Kickstarter for the Ghost Ship audio drama, and you can find that on the Kickstarter platform or go to my website and click on the, the link in the upper right hand corner. It'll take you right there, or you can search for it on Kickstarter. Uh, we still have, I think, 20 at this point, I think 26 more days to go. We're closing in on 70% funded. Um, I'd really like to be funded in the next couple of days. I think that's entirely possible. So please help us do that. And um, if you can't pledge, please uh, post, share, retweet, and help spread the word. When does it end? Uh, November 18th. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Of course, support Madeline's work and everything that she has done now and in the future. I'm sure this won't be her last interview on the show whatsoever. I'm expecting her next year as well, too. As always, you can find this interview and thousands of others on our website, tgtmedia.com and our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Hey all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you everyone for listening and watching over the years and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented and creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.